talk this morning is about uh, nutrient management practices on, on small livestock farms. I'm not going to get a lot of detail about how to actually do a nutrient management plan on a small farm. I guess that's going to probably vary from, from uh, source to source to source, but I want to talk about some practices we've found or I've found that I think are, are good guidelines that small farms ought to, ought to be following and good recommendations we can make. I guess the biggest question is, uh, what do you think is a small farm? I mean, it, it's kind of soup to nuts in a way. Here's, uh, you know, 25 goats. Here's a couple hundred dairy cows that are grazing. There's a few chickens on a farm that happened to be pretty much a menagerie for fowl. Um, 500 milking ewes. This is a pretty cool farm. I've been there lots of times. Uh, they produce artisan cheese for a very high-end market. If you want to spend $35 a pound for cheese, you should come to that, that farm. Um, the 35 South Farm, some beef cows, 65 or 70 head, a breeding farm of horses. So a small farm um, kind of across the board a little bit. So I'm, I'm not going to throw out a question for you here, but uh, I'd like you to think just what makes a small farm small? Um, could it be acreage? Um, sometimes farms on small farms are very, very limited acreage. They're small, um, you know, 20 goats on five farms, I guess that would qualify as a small farm. Animal numbers, sometimes low, but again, that can vary. Um, 150 cow dairy farm would be considered small in much of the country, um, and in some parts of the country it would be considered quite large. Uh, small farms may have a special kind of a market they're, they're uh, producing for, some kind of a niche market. Um, small farm uh, um, meat being produced for a, for a specialty trade of some kind. Height, well, I'm just joking there. Five foot two, I guess, would be height. Well, this is the USDA answer uh, for a small farm. A small farmer is defined as one that grows and sells between $1,000 and $250,000 per year in agricultural products. Again, that's a nice big range uh, to look at. Uh, $250,000, what's that, 75 dairy cow? You know, is that about right? I think that's probably in the realm of uh, uh, what it what might be, maybe 100 dairy cows. $1,000, uh, $1, I guess below that we'd, we, we'd be looking more at uh, maybe kind of a hobby farm. And this is going to vary by states. A lot of states are going to have um, uh, farmland tax assessments that are going to re require a certain amount of uh, income to qualify for that farmland tax assessment. In our state, we only required $500 of income to actually qualify for farmland tax assessments. In some other states, it might be quite a bit more than that. So again, that's the USDA definition. Um, this comes off of uh, USDA's website. They kind of divide between more of, uh, let's just call residential or I don't, want to, I don't want to use the term hobby farms, but retirement farms, lifestyle farms. Um, there's a major, there's an occupation there other than just farming. Um, and then more of what we'd call an intermediate uh, family farm, probably still less than that $250,000 gross. Um, they report farming as their major occupation. Uh, occupation. Low sales farms might have less than $100,000 uh, in sales. High sales farms between one hundred and two hundred. dollars and fifty thousand dollars in in sales. So it's a pretty pretty broad look we're we're looking at. Um, this is kind of interesting uh, from the the two thousand and seven census of farms. If you look at that um, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar from less than ten thousand dollars to up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, sixty percent of all those farms of of all farms, not just the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar farms. 60% of all farms are less than $10,000 of sales, okay? Six in 10 farms have less than $10,000 in sales. Land in farms, well, that's lower, 18%. Um, cattle inventory, 9%. Horse inventory, 65% <laughs> of our horse farms are on those uh, less than $10,000 of, of income. And oftentimes I wonder where horse income comes from. I'm not, not sure so much in my state where, how they're actually making money, unless they're part of other, other kind of uh, you know, endeavors on the same farm. Okay, we may, not use the, we may use another governmental um, um, recommendation, and this would be the EPA um, uh, approach. You know, we can, um, we're all familiar with CAFOs, small CAFOs, medium CAFOs. Um, a small farm would be, um, a small CAFO would be less than 300 head of, uh, 
of beef, veal, or dairy, less than 200 dairy cattle, less than 750 swine uh, that are greater than 55 pounds, 3,000 swine less than 55 pounds, 16,500 turkeys, 37,000 chickens, 3,000 sheep, 150 horses. So by the, the EPA standard, that would be what we're, um, where we're, uh, what, what, would, what they would consider to be a small farm. I'd like to maybe talk about what I'll call small farm distinctives for just a little bit. Generally, small farms are going to have less animals, fewer animals, and because of that, they're going to have less waste to handle. Okay? Um, they might have some other problems related to having that waste, but they're going to have less waste to handle. They're not going to have the volume that, uh, or the amount that other farms have. Quite often, they don't have a suitable storage structure. I know that most small farms that I go on in my state, they probably they may have a designated area for manure. It all goes here. It all goes in the woods. Um, but quite often they don't have any kind of a designated structure unless they've gotten generally in some sort of government program that helps them get a structure. Um, they probably have less land available for grazing. Um, they probably have less land available for spreading. In, in fact, when it comes to most horse farms, uh, they don't want to spread it anyway. They want to get rid of it. <laughs> if they can, they just soon haul it off site. Um, and generally, operators have less experience in waste management. Closer to neighbors, probably. They're they're, they're often located in some small uh, um, small regions or a locale that where they may be totally surrounded by a, an urban area, so they might have more neighbor concerns than someone else is going to have. They probably have a limited budget budget for manure handling and storage. However, in some areas, you know, some farmers tend to be more affluent and would have, would have income or dollars for that, that. They might have the option of disposing manure off-site. Now, this is something that uh, larger farms probably don't have such an option for. They might, but a lot of small farms would, if they can, they'd like to haul it off-site. Unfortunately, sometimes off-site means in a dumpster uh, that gets hauled to the landfill. Sometimes it might mean just stored off in the woods somewhere. Um, composting might be an option. In fact, a lot of small farmers, you'll ask, you'll ask if they compost, and they say, oh, yeah, I compost. But uh, I think generally there's not a lot of understanding what compost means. It might, to some people, it might mean that I keep it in a pile for a year, and after it rots, I try to get somebody to come and pick it up. So that wouldn't really be composting. Uh, less aware of manure management, BMPs? Probably so. Um, I put a... Um, a question mark there, because I think oftentimes uh, newer or beginning farmers are more open to uh, waste management ideas than maybe some more established farmers are. Uh, they're new, they want to learn, and, and they might be more, um, you know, more interested in and more willing to make some changes. Well, let's go back to this that, uh, that uh, I'm sure we've all seen this diagram many times, um, or, or similar diagrams that we've got. Uh, Nutrients coming onto a farm. We've got nutrients that are exiting the farm. We we've got um, nutrients that are causing balances or imbalances in the in the soil. Now I think it's I think actually getting farmers to address if they're a small farm with not a lot of acreage, getting them to uh, accept the idea of actually spreading and managing and nutrient management plans on farms is probably going to be kind of difficult. Um, but I think we can focus on things like imbalances, ways they can, uh, they can get around that, that uh, concern. And of course, manure storages are, are one of the ways we, we can do that. Now, th these are some guidelines we use on small farms in our state. In fact, we use these guidelines for all farms in New Jersey, but most of our farms are on the smaller side anyway. Um, so, and this is the basic of our nutrient management requirements within the state. But I think they're a good set of guidelines. Uh, our first point is we, we always encourage our producers to store their manure in a dry, level, impermeable location, or as impermeable as possible, free from stormwater runoff. Location should be at least 100 feet from waters or wetlands. That comes right off of our state regulations. So I, th I think that's a, a good thing we can, we can uh, look at on small farms. If they don't have good storages now, we can encourage them to um, at least consider how they're storing their manure. Secondly, each farm should have a, a plan for managing manure spreading and, and disposal. Now, disposal, if disposal is an option, 
then, uh, then, then I think farmers, uh, small farms should be, uh, should be encouraged to do that. We have a number of uh, centralized, uh, small centralized composting areas in our state, uh, which pick up mostly horse, horse manure, but they, they get manure from other sources as well. But it's all small farm manure. They compost it, and then they market it as mulch. Managing stormwater, so so your the water stays out of uh, uh, out of your manure pad, out of your manure storage, um, might require the use of some buffers or some vegetative filters, and I'll show you some slides in a couple moments of that. Um, controlling animal access to streams and waterways, again, that's right uh, right out of our state uh, regulations. Um, and again, does it, sometimes animals have to have access to waterways if they if they or or, or streams if that's their only source of water uh, consumption. So, um, but that include fencing, maybe some uh, stream crossings, controlling farm erosion, and finally being aware of those neighbor concerns. Um, we asked a survey of horse farmers how many of you how many of them dispose of manure off farm. Over forty percent of them dispose. Uh, uh, dispose of manure off the farm. I mentioned to you a centralized composter. This is a guy that does that. He comes, he's in the northern part of the state. He comes and he does a variety of things. He'll do a, he'll do a, if you've got manure stacked up for 10 years, he'll come and he'll, he'll haul it off and he'll compost it. And he has regular contracts with certain farmers where he'll leave a, a dumpster at the farm, a roll off, and he'll pick it up on a regular basis. Manure storage, now again, sometimes smaller farms don't have a lot of dollars. They may not be able to put up a, a, a storage that has a roof on it or proper, uh, uh, proper storage for solid manure. So um, what this farmer's done is he's, got a, he's put down a, mostly a gravel pad, which is uh, uh, three sides on it. It's a relatively impermeable base, or we hope that it is. It's um, 100 feet from waters or wetlands. And it's um, got a vegetative filter on the back side of it. So I think that's a good recommendation for a small farm. They don't have to put up an elaborate uh, concrete pad. Um, they can put up a relatively simple structure like this that allows them to store their manure. I want them to keep water out of uh, uh, their animals out of water. There's a there's a dry lot just to the right there, which was a you know a muddy mess. So they shouldn't have been storing their manure um, the way they were. Um, right by that stream, which is in a sensitive watershed anyway. Um, this is a, a farm that had several hundred horses. Um, he thought he had a good system there, you know, had woods on the one side, woods on the other, a graveyard on the other side, and, uh, and that's what his storage looked like. It was a mess. Now, he's changed that subsequently, made some changes, but uh, he had a waterway on the side there. So I guess if you're talking the good, the bad, and the ugly, this is probably the ugly. <laughs> Um, this is a, a, a farm we assisted a few years ago. They had previously stored all their all their manure um, on on one on one field right along a ditch, uh, which ended in, uh, ended up going into a string. So we came in, we helped them put up this this small composting uh, uh, pad that you see, which uh, certainly took away some of their concerns. This is actually on our campus uh, for our horse farm. You know, we've, I, like, I want to point out that nice vegetative buffer on the on the downward side of the of the storage. So again, the storage doesn't it needs to be adequate in size to meet your needs. But we've got a 35 well foot well vegetated buffer uh, to uptake nutrients that come out of that storage. So I'm not for small farms. I'm not a big proponent of of roofs on store small storages. Maybe in certain environments, rainfall, et cetera, you you, you have to consider that. But I, I think there's other things that can be. Uh, considered that are, are more cost effective. Okay, where to store and spread? Again, you have to make um, proper investigations of your area, um, streams, lakes, aquifers, slopes for spreading, neighbors. Now, here's something that, that, that I will generally tell people that on a small farm, if you're spreading manure on a small farm, I don't think it really does you any good to take a lot of manure samples uh, for your spreading, particularly if you're spreading every day. Um, you might you might spread over the you might take samples over the course of a year and come up with a baseline, but in general, I think using book values is probably uh, about as good as you're going to get uh, for an accurate uh, estimate um, on a smaller farm. Okay, here's a 
a spreader. That's a spreader for you. Mill Creek spreader being pulled by a uh, um, by a, uh, an ATV vehicle. And there are plenty of these uh, Mill Creek spreaders uh, available, uh, at least in our area, farmers who, who use these. I think we should always be encouraging farmers, kind of regardless of their size, to develop a farm map. I think they ought to have an idea of what's what and what's where on their farm. They need to know where the water's at. Um, they need to know where the slopes are. And based on that, they need to they need to be able to make it, uh, some uh, adjustments and some um, plans about where they're going to spread and where they're not going to spread. Now, if they don't have a, a map such as this, which they can probably get for the local soil conservation district or NRCS or, you know, Google Maps for that matter, um, there's a number of sources they can get decent maps from. They can draw their own. Um, that's but, but they need to have some idea where their manure is um, going and how they're managing their farm. Sacrifice areas. Now, I mentioned I'm a pretty big proponent of storages. I'm also a big supporter of sacrifice areas, if you can. Now, what's a sacrifice area? Is that where I'm going to kill my sheep? No, that's not. Um, some people might call it an exercise lot or a rest lot or a dry lot. Um, it's an area where our animals can kind of congregate. We can feed them in that spot. We can water them in that spot. They could have some shelter in that area. They, it could be a semi-confined area, which would probably let them have some some access to pastures and and grazing areas that are outside of that lot. Um, sometimes we would include what we call a heavy use pad around the waterers, especially, um, which is we've excavated some of the dirt around it. We put in some kind of a geotextile pad, and then maybe a couple of different layers of stone to uh, eliminate the mud that would be around the watering area. Um, You use a sacrifice area on your farm, and um, about half of our producers uh, uh, said that they did of some kind. This is horse producers again. And here's a not a real good uh, thing to, to, to kind of a de uh, not a good kind of a sacrifice area to have. Just one great big lot where they graze and they feed and they water the same place. Here's kind of the idea, and I got this out of a of a publication from I think it was University of Kentucky, kind of a you know, you've got your dry, uh, dry lot area and then um, where your animals are, and then you have fences out to your rotational pastures. But I think we, we did a survey recently looking at uh, nutrient management practices on horse farms, especially looking at feed management. And I think the things we, one of the things I came out of it with is that sacrifice areas and rotational grazing, if you can get farmers, horse producers to do those things, that's good. I mean, those are, those are good management practices that uh, hopefully they'll follow. Again, of course, good, uh, well-managed pastures are always going to take up more nutrients than uh, poorly, poorly managed pastures. And of course, you get that whole recycling thing going um, with your horses or with animals in general. Poorly vegetated pastures are not going to take up uh, as many nutrients. Um, erosion, I mentioned. So when, when that's a possibility, uh, stream crossings are, are, are possible. NRCS can help design these and maybe help fund them too. Okay, again, I went through those, those kind of uh, six areas, storage, disposal and spreading, stormwater management, um, access to streams and waterways, erosion, neighbors. And finally, just kind of putting it all together, small farms can have some unique challenges because of um, their size, both acreage and animal numbers. There's not enough land for spreading. There's probably a lack of understanding of nutrient management requirements, lack of familiarity with BMPs. They may be located uh, in, in uh, or near populated areas. Those, those neighbors, those urbanized neighbors that might surround us, they probably don't, many of them don't have a good understanding of what we do and why we do it. Um, they may be able to dispose of waste off-site, which is, which is positive, provided it's not going to landfill. Um, and beginning on new farmers may willingly make changes. Again, I think that that's a possibility. Um, small farmers, uh, small, small farmers don't always fit existing models that might work for a, a larger farm for manure management, so patience is required. And if you want to see a nice fact sheet on, uh, on nutrient management, go to the eExtension website and you'll find a, a fact sheet there by a guy named Randall, Randall James, I think it is. He's done a nice little program for how you manage, uh, 
manure on a small farm, and, it, and opposed to looking at it as just so many pounds produced per given time period, he does it by by time. Okay, my cows produce so many, so many, so much manure per, per two months. So two months storage goes here. Two months storage goes here. So it's a take a look at it. It's it's helpful. Any questions?